So this morning when I made my opening remarks and I was talking about the dramatic progress of medicine, one of the things I said was perhaps we found a much better way to do brain-computer interface. And I was referring to our next speaker, Tom Oxley, um, the head of Synchron, who we are, should celebrate because he did his first, he implanted his first, or someone else implanted his first endovascular brain computer interface in an ALS patient in the US just a few months ago. Um, so please come tell us how it went. Thank you. A lot of the reports were that it was the first patient because Australians aren't always considered humans by US citizens, but they are. You, no, you did say US, but. Um, yeah, we have, we, we, our program's been running for 10 years and we, we did kick off our first in humans um, in 2019 and it's been a long journey to get to the FDA stage of an IDE. Um, so it is an exciting time for brain computer interfaces and the journey to get to the US approval was a journey of um, I think six pre-submission meetings over five years with the FDA until the point of all that list that David was going through. So I'm going to take you on that journey a little bit. I'm a neurologist. Um, I'm the CEO of Synchron. I uh, came out of my PhD in Australia years ago and I then came to the US to learn interventional neurology in New York, which is now where the company is. Um, so I think the vision for the technology that we're working on, for, generally for brain-computer interfaces, is hands-free personal computing. So for people whose hands don't work, that is a really big deal. And you know, you'll read in the media about you know, what that might mean for human civilization moving forward, but the reason we're building this is because a lot of people in the world can't use their hands to control digital devices, and we all do and have become dependent on them. And try losing your ability to control your smartphone for a few hours and see how your life becomes. So this is a huge problem, um, a huge unmet need, and that's that's the uh, promise of brain-computer interfaces. What we're doing is we're doing it through the blood vessels. So we have built technology that can deliver um, a live stream feed out of the brain in certain regions to drive these systems. Um, so. That's what we're doing. I'm just putting up this guidance document because the whole history of brain-computer interfaces, as I've seen it, our first five million came from DARPA funding. It was the start of our project. And brain-computer interfaces are going to be another technology on that list of things that DARPA contributed to the world that follows rockets, internet, GPS, and now brain-computer interfaces. Um, and part of the reason there was a guidance document well before there was any technology approved was because um, there was a, a, a lineage of multiple DARPA directors putting people in FDA while the technology was still in the very early preclinical stages. So we now have a guidance document, but you know we're the only company I'm aware of that now have an IDE for a permanent implant. Um, so in a long time since some early research came out that I'll get to, this technology is finally coming from academic into, into um, the realm of accessibility for patients at the commercial domain. So a brain-computer interface essentially is a technology that goes into the brain and restores a lost body part. So I read that um, guidance document uses the term neuroprosthesis synonymous with BCI. That's how I read the definition of a brain-computer interface. Uh, the term BCI is gone very broad now. It sort of seems to include a lot of other things that I've traditionally considered things like deep brain stimulation or other things, you know, not a BCI. For me, a BCI is something that connects a brain to an external device where there's a restoration of a lost body part. The cochlear device that restores hearing, I would consider that a neuroprosthesis or a brain-computer interface. Um, so what we're working on is, is the motor system. The motor system controls the motor in your, the motor movements, all of the muscles in my mouth right now are controlled by my motor cortex, my whole, all the muscles in my, pretty much any way that I can exert my physical will, uh, demonstrate free will into the physical world is through my motor system. So actually it's the limiting way that information gets out of our brain to the external world. So everything in the brain has to go through the motor system, so it's pretty important. Um, vision. Speech, speech. I feel like is a is a subcomponent because you still need the motor system for speech. Um, so yeah, BCI, the way we're building it, is initially focused on the motor system. 
And so the guidance document uses the term motor capability. That's a pretty broad term. It's not something a neurologist would ever speak about, motor capability. So let's break down the motor system. The motor system starts in the motor cortex, motor intent. Uh, that's typically not really thought of much because we've never engaged with that system, but you can detect motor intent by looking at the activity in the motor cortex. So there's neurons firing at certain you know, rates whenever you're trying to move a certain part of your body, distributed spatially representing the muscles all across your body somatotopically. Um, now that signal then goes down through your brainstem, through your spinal cord, to your peripheral nerves, to your muscles, and then for the most part to a digital device. Now you can use your muscles to do a lot of other things in the world, but how much of your day is spent with your motor system engaging with a digital device now? a lot more than 15 years ago, and who knows what in another 15 years. So we've boiled down the problem of BCI for the motor control of digital devices because we don't have to rebuild an operating system. There are already extremely powerful operating systems to connect with. So we constrained the problem down to how do we get motor intent signal, convert that through Bluetooth into a mechanism that can control widely available systems like you're all working on right now. So that way it's just brain intent into Bluetooth to mouse and keyboard control, then gives you access back to these incredibly powerful systems. So that's what, that's what we're working on. So if you think about the problem that way, paralysis is due to a range of conditions. This is actually a huge, huge problem. It's not just stroke, it's not just ALS, it's not just multiple sclerosis, it's not just muscular dystrophy, it's not just transverse myelitis. There's a injury, there's a whole range of conditions that stop your ability to control your personal device. And so there's five million in a severe category, but there's many more than that in less than severe category. Okay, so I got into this space. I was doing internal medicine training in Australia. I was on night shift and I found this article two years later in 2008. And this blew my mind. I was like, okay, this, this is going to be something. They've figured out how to get data out of the brain and make it control a robotic limb. Now, fast forward 15 years, this technology is still causing nature papers every few weeks, but it hasn't become widely available to many patients, so why is that? There's a range of conditions, but just hold that there were impediments to carrying this technology through to commercialization on account of a range of issues, which I won't go into, but essentially if you put needles into the brain, there are, there are problems. Um, but it works really well for a period of time. So, uh, fast forward to 2016, and this was the first report of not needles, but electrodes onto the surface of the brain. So still recording local field potentials, not single neurons, but small populations of neurons. And that was used to, con to control over Bluetooth, well it wasn't over Bluetooth, but it controlled a speller. And this woman has locked in syndrome from ALS, this became her primary form of communication. Um, she was also using eye gaze, but eye gaze has its challenges. Um, and this became her primary form. Still very slow, but very effective. Fast forward to last year, Eddie Chang's group at UCSF published in New England Journal of Medicine, now high frequency. This is a big array. This is a 128 channel array. It was a large craniotomy. A lot of the skull was removed to put this in, but they were able to decode the motor activity that controlled the vocal cords in a patient who wasn't able to speak, but could till, still attempt to control his vocal cords and they could decode what he was trying to say by training a model based upon the activity they recorded during attempted speaking. This, for me, this group is right now top of the game with surface electrode BCI right now. Eddie Chang is an incredible guy. If you watch this video, it'll, it'll, um, it's pretty, it's mind blowing. So this was proof for me that you don't necessarily need to put needles into the brain in order to record sufficient activity to drive a system that could be beneficial for patients. Um, there's a big gap between the first patient and this patient in terms of what they could do, but somewhere in the middle there is probably a system that could change millions of lives based upon the problem set that's out there right now. So what I set out to do was to build an electrode that didn't require open brain surgery to go into the brain. And for my mind, looking at the rapid development of the neurovascular field, um, there was this history with cardiology of incredible electronic technology delivered in through blood vessels. It just hadn't ever happened to the brain yet. And for me, 10 years ago, thinking that BCI could be that initial application of this technology, and that's where we've gotten to now. 
So it solves a few things. You don't cross the blood-brain barrier. We know how the blood vessels react to devices because we all know what happens when you put a stent in. So we have a sense of that, and that, that ability to present that data to the FDA was very important. Um, so we know how it reacts, and it doesn't have the same reaction as when you stick a needle in the brain. Um, so it's safe for a lifetime. It doesn't need to be removed. So this was the initial argument. This is a BCI technology that stays in there forever, which is what most medical devices do. It's a recent thing with BCI that you might even think about removing it, but that's the only approval so far because there hasn't been long-term safety demonstrated. But probably more importantly, from a scalability, from a business case issue, we don't have to create a work, surgical workflow to access um, very large numbers of patients because the ability to go to an angiogram or a cath lab to get a stent is now very common. And you don't need to be in a quaternary level, um, high level neurosurgical facility, secondary level hospitals and up have cath labs. And so the procedure required to do ours is, is um, at a level you know, lower in terms of acuity than uh, the open brain surgery. So this is the technology, we built a stent we put electrodes on it, we put it into the motor cortex in a very large vein, top of the brain, called the superior sagittal sinus, and we put a cable on it and then brought it out of the brain through a pre-existing hole in the brain. So we didn't put any new holes in the skull, and this is what it looks like in our first patient. You can see the line going up through the blood vessel into the top of the brain there. Yeah, so just to go back, so I said that there's five million people with severe uh, paralysis, but this is actually a much bigger problem than that. If you start to consider people that have arthritis or other um, more common conditions that stop your hands from working and our continuing dependency on devices, where are we going to be in another 15 years in terms of our reliability on the digital ecosystem to connect with the world? In a, probably in a place it's hard to imagine relative to even where we are right now. So I think that ultimately if brain-computer interfaces are safe, uh, affordable, and uh, accessible for large numbers of patients, this could become a technology that impacts a very, very large number of people. And perhaps there are many around, you know, walking around, hopefully invisible, not, you know, people don't want to be seen to be different. It's inside, it's helping you connect with the digital ecosystem, it's overcoming your disability. So we think there's maybe 100 million people in the world who potentially could benefit from this type of technology. Okay, so what's motor intent? So motor capability, it starts with motor intent. This is free will. This is your brain signatures associated with trying to move some part of your body to engage with the world to you know, do something. So we can detect that. So we put sensors near there and we do basic things. We just try to capture what the activity of certain types of different movements are, whether it's upper limb or lower limb, it's all somatotopically differentiated. And we do signal processing to delineate those and build a dictionary of different outputs that we can then turn into Bluetooth um, action, um, action outputs. So here's our system. So um, on the left, you can see the types of patterns that we basically run through with our patients. So they'll turn on the system, there'll be an onboarding, they'll start to attempt to move different parts of their body. We'll capture all that, we'll translate it, we'll lock it, and then we'll turn it into an output. And basically, if we can achieve point and click, then the patient has access to widely available systems. So we want to work with Microsoft and Apple and Amazon to then control those systems. This is what uh, your brain looks like if you remove everything except for the veins. So that's the trajectory of the map that the neurointerventionist has to travel up to get up to the top of the brain. Um, and it's not open brain surgery. So this is what you would look like if you were lying in an angiography suite. They cover you up, just expose the neck and expose the groin. We come into the groin to just get a picture of the whole process. And we come into the neck to go into the jugular vein to leave the device up and leave the uh, battery and the communication channel under the skin and the chest. So that's one of our devices um, inside, just under the skull, sitting in the top of the brain between the left and right motor cortices after it's been implanted. I showed you that already, but there it is again. Um, and then we get this. So this is a uh, couple of things. Co-registration of the, the blue is the vein that was uh, um, captured before the procedure. The brain is from the MR, structural brain, showing where the brain is. The color is where the fMRI activity was. And then the dots or the squares are where the electrodes land ultimately. So your intervention is able to land the electrodes over the spot. Now we're targeting motor cortex. You'll see a lot of the electrodes slip back over sensory cortex a little bit. So we're still fine tuning the, um, you know, fine tuning of the delivery. It's a couple of millimeters off, but the device was still working. Uh, this is the, th the sorts of things that we're working on now to improve upon. 
Our patients are typically going home at 48 hours and they need aspirin and clopidogrel to stop the blood clots forming on the device for three months and then aspirin for 12 months. Um, that's what it would look like if you had an x-ray once you've got one in. So the, the minimal viable product is basically what is the minimum amount needed to control a system that could improve your life if you had severe paralysis. And I'm setting that at around the sort of four to six output. If you think about changing your Netflix password with your smart TV controller, it kind of is a bit annoying. You have to navigate your way up and around the keyboard using up, down, left, right, back, enter. They're about the fundamental lowest number of buttons you might use to control the system with a pretty high degree of um, control. So we're getting up to that point now, and I'll show you sort of where we've started and where we're getting to, but that's what it would look like, the implanted bit. And then the explanted bit is that white device in the middle that receives the Bluetooth signal, has the algorithm, and then shoots out a network which can then engage in the, in the digital ecosystem either through Bluetooth or Wi-Fi in this case. Okay, is, is the audio up? Please. So this is a video of uh, our second patient in Australia. The first day that we turned on the system, with this first generation system, we're using infrared through the skin. So it is taking a few weeks for the blood to go away because the blood blocking the, all the uh, bruising blocks the transmission. So it takes a few weeks. But so he went home after two days, a few weeks of rest. Then this is the first day the system transmission was working. And we're just going to show you his reaction to having the first button control. Um, there's eye tracking in this. So what we started with was piggybacking off eye tracking. Because if we're building out discrete buttons, um, the thing we haven't gotten to yet is really good trajectory control around the screen, two-dimensional trajectory control. So the patients are starting, if their eyes are working with, with eye gaze, which gives really good movement of the mouse around, but then we give them multiple different types of clicks. Left click, right click, zoom click, double click. It's sort of depending on what they think about, they can exert those different types of clicks. And it was the combination that let him control Windows 10 here almost immediately. But I just want to show you what it was like for him when to achieve that first click. So we, the way it starts is we go through, our engineers go to the home of the patient. So this is not in lab. The patient goes home. We then, our engineers go to the patient's house for several days a week. And we have them train through attempted. So this patient has ALS. He's still talking. You can see his voice is getting softer. At this point, he's still talking. And he's got a little bit of arm mobility, but he's not able to use, um, use Windows anymore. So no worries. Uh, that's, I'm not Lizzie. Where's Lizzie? Am I getting kicked off? I think I'm done. Oh. Um, Yeah, so we're basically finding a way to, so ultimately as the technology goes to many, many more people, we can't have engineers, thousands of engineers going out. So what we're learning with the algorithm development with our patients is now being translated into a software that the patients will go home with. So you'll notice there was no screen on the device that goes home with the patient because it is dependent on some other device that they're using. So we're giving Microsoft Surface tablets to our first patients. And we're, we're working with both Microsoft and Apple, but um, the, so there's our system depends on an app within another ecosystem, which is becoming not uncommon with FDA. Um, so launch the app, you go through a calibration, you try to move different parts of your body, we do the classification, capture it, and then turn it into outputs. OK, let's try. Do you guys want to hit play, see if that works? Please. You're in that corner? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, one second. Can you just look up here for a second while I click on this guy? OK. So, so if the line goes below green, Phil, yeah. then it'll click. So try and, do you see that file? Um, does any old file? Try and stare at it and think about moving for a long time and it'll start zooming in. Yeah, and release. So you made a click, your first click with your brain. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. What? So, so now I want you to 
click on the single click button on the right. Yeah, and then do you see the word icon right at the bottom? Um, no. At, at, at the program, at the bar, bottom at the bar. You know the icon? It's a little bit. So this guy here. Yeah? Yep. So I want you to click on that by staring at it and thinking about moving or planning the movement. Yeah, and then try and relax back. All right, so you open up Word. Holy moly. Now, I want you to open up exactly there in the corner. So. Thank you. Uh, I think we might be on a different presentation. Did you open up the same file? Oh yeah, I had three PowerPoint files open. This is a different one. That moment though, I mean, so that was just his first click. He's now up to, I think, four different outputs. Um, and, you know, we're, we've, we've got a paper going now, which is, we're getting, we're getting, when you get up to seven or eight, it starts, the accuracy starts to drop off. So that's the work that we're working on right now, but it's still very early days. Um, this is certainly a trade-off relative to what you've seen with the Utah Array technology. It's not at that level. But the trade-off is substantial because we know that this technology can exist for a lifetime much more safely. So it is a very different approach. Um, and it's been phenomenal watching the data science team have constant breakthroughs every few weeks with more and more information that they're seeing and being able to decode. How'd you go? Here in that corner. Did you find him? Oh yeah, I think this is it. Okay. How much time have I got, Lisa? Eight minutes. Okay. So this is Philip again. So now he's on to typing. Um, I don't think I can, um, oh, there we go. Yeah, so he's at home. Uh, just, just shows a couple of the features of the, of the program. So it's ECOG, it's coming out at 16 channels. This is Rodney. So here's a different type of speller. So different patients have different levels of disability. So we're trying to do as little as we can in terms of the OS because Apple and Microsoft have very powerful, we're not trying to build a new operating system. So this is more about refining the ability to achieve consistent and stable Bluetooth outputs to control external systems. Um, but you know, once you've done that, this is, this is why it's a motor prosthesis because you've now digitized down to a series of ones and zeros things that previously were controlling things attached to your body. But now it's digital output so you can do it, use it to do a range of things. But this is a FDA trial to demonstrate that you can use that to do something relevant. So FDA and Medicare are not interested in him watching, using this to watch Netflix. He's got to do things that actually are going to improve his quality of life. Um, so things like this are how we're sort of measuring the study. This is Phil texting his wife. Now he is totally dependent on his wife at home with ALS. He's, his speech is getting worse and worse. She has to and try and interpret what he wants at every moment. Now that they can, he can text her, she can not only be in the kitchen, she can leave the house. So the ability to regain the capacity for text messaging is so incredibly powerful and you can't really imagine what that's like until you've actually lost it. Then you only then realize how dependent we've become on this technology. And I know there's a lot of negativity about digital technology. The reality is it's phenomenal. It's amazing. And yes, social media is bad. TikTok's bad. But if you take away the entire system, you can't, you can't live the way we want to live. Uh, just this is this is, this came out last week in the Economist and Philip this is Phil who you just saw he gave he just said a couple of things here that have been I just think this is the most incredible interview I've seen and I had we had nothing to do with this but the thing is it's remarkably unobtrusive he said people with BCIs they don't want to have things sticking out of their head they don't want to look different they don't want it for it to look weird it's meant to be invisible and it should just work that's a really powerful thing for patients. Um, uh, He's talking about what's, you know, it enables me to use emails, use WhatsApp, um, live a normal computer life. Uh, 
you know, he was working part time. He's and not able to do that now, but he still was able to participate in some of his online work. So this technology lets you not just maybe engage in your digital ecosystem for social reasons, but also maybe for work reasons. And then finally, you know, he said this again: the best thing is you don't know it's there. So I think you know Zuckerberg says that implantable BCIs are not going to be a thing because the solution is going to be headsets, and I just find that hard to believe. I just don't think that people are going to be wanting wanting to wear headsets. Um, I don't know, cataract lenses, you know, there are going to be all sorts of different interfaces coming out, but I think BCIs have this opportunity of being completely invisible, being very effective in restoring incredible capability. So this is some of the data that's um, in press right now. We've got five patient years of safety data. Um, signal stability is great. Um, that was expected. There's lots of subdural ECOG data showing that um, data is stable over time with ECOG. That's different. It is an order of magnitude bigger than an, um, the typical invasive penetrating arrays, which are around you know, 50 to 70 microns. Ours is more like 500 microns. So trade-off again, we don't get single cell neurons. We get local field potentials, but they're much more stable. Um, yeah, so we have the next stage of our study. This is an EFS study in the US. We have another study running in Australia, but this is what's most active right now. It's happening in New York and Pittsburgh. Um, we've enrolled our first subject who was implanted in July. Second subject was um, consented yesterday. And we've got several other subjects out to the end of the year. So this is going to form the basis of what we use to present to the FDA for the basis for the pivotal study, which is what will be needed for pre-marketing approval and hopefully um, getting first to market. Um, we don't know how big that study will be. That's a critical question right now and that we're having with FDA. How many patients is needed to demonstrate safety and effectiveness? Um, just to speak about what we're learning about the study, paralysis is due to a range of conditions and we're learning which type of conditions we think can be beneficial. Conditions like multiple sclerosis, we were not expecting to see patients. We're getting referrals from all sorts of different conditions now from physicians who are hearing about the technology. Um, and ultimately, heading towards the pivotal trial, we're looking for sites to enrol. Um, so if you do have any interested sites, we'd love to hear from you as we prepare for a rollout for a much larger study over the next 18 to 24 months. Uh, this is Graham, who's now passed away from his ALS, but this was also his first moment spelling with his wife, who was in a similar situation. And I just, it's, you know, you saw Philip's reaction. This was his reaction. He brought his wife in to show her. And it's this incredible moment where your world opens back up. That's, what, that's the power of this technology. So. Um, this is our team, um, exciting team of sort of mix of academia and commercial people coming together, really motivated, incredible, talented team that I love working with on a day-to-day -day basis. We're based in Brooklyn, uh, in New York City. Um, yeah, so if you'd like to come and work for us, we would uh, love to hear from you. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Yep. We can. We're seeing signal from upper limb, but the lower limb signal is, is better and stronger. Yeah. But we're increasingly finding ways to separate out the different signal sources, but definitely the lower limb. A lot of the switches that you're seeing are driven from lower limb attempted representations. Right-left mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right, bilateral. Um, Yeah, we've done it a little bit different to the brain gate, the Utah array and brain gate systems that have formed most of the basis of BCI work to date have been around training, um, training individual neurons to do what you want them to do, like you know, um, two two dimensional trajectory training with calibration burdens and re daily calibration burdens that require training. We've actually gone a pretty simple um, linear decoding approach that we just use support vector machines to do classification. 
which means that that's why he can use it immediately because there's not, as long as you have spent a lifetime trying to move certain parts of your body and you know how to say, press down your right ankle and you can do that repeatedly, then we can characterize that. But the challenge is how do you make the patient think about this? How do you make the neurons behave in the same repeated way with a low cognitive burden? And to do that, we've kept it really simple. So I think as we get on and on, we're gonna put more and more burden on the patient to get better, but there are definitely, there are some patients who are better than others, and it's got to do with your ability to have you know, volitional control over your brain. But I think for a mass application, you have to keep it really simple. Mm. Oh. Thank you, thanks Lisa.